Hi everybody, it's Eric Murray from thesugarhuddle.com. Well, that time has come, just a few days away. Uh, on Thursday night, we're gonna have the NFL opener for the 2018 season. The defending world champion Philadelphia Eagles, of course, are gonna take on the Atlanta Falcons. That's gonna be a great game. It's gonna be exciting. That football is finally, finally back. We just had college football debut this past weekend, but now the NFL, that time of year, that magical time of year, so, of course, because we're just a few days away, obviously, I've gone through all my previews of each division, all these different teams, picked all these division winners. So, of course, now it's time to make my playoff and my Super Bowl 53 predictions. So, I'm going to go on down the line here. First of all, AFC wildcard game, I have the Ravens as a sixth seed getting in as a final wildcard, and I have them playing the Titans, who will be the three seed, who, of course, will win the AFC South. I have the Ravens winning that game 24-21. Then the other wild card game in the AFC, I have the Texans who will be the higher of the wild card teams. They'll be the five seed. I have them taking on the AFC West champion Chargers who will be the four seed. And I have the Texans winning that game 31 24. So, first of all, let me kind of break those games down before we keep going. So, I, I look at it, and you know, with the Ravens and the Titans, even though the Ravens haven't made the playoffs since 2014, and the Titans were just there last year and just won a, a playoff game last year when they upset the Chiefs. Played the Patriots tough for about a quarter and a half in the divisional playoff before they petered out. I still feel like the Titans are kind of like an upstart team. And maybe part of that, too, is they've got a new head coach this year. They got rid of Mike Malarkey. Of course, now they have Mike Vrabel taking over as head coach. And then he brings in Matt LaFleur to be his offensive coordinator. LaFleur, of course, worked under Sean McVay in, in Los Angeles last year with the Rams. And they did some great things together. So it's kind of a revolutionary offense. Should be a much better offense and a much tougher offense to defend. Defensively, they they continue to get better, especially in that secondary. They had Malcolm Butler, Super Bowl champion. He knows what it takes to get it done in the postseason. But nonetheless, they still feel like an upstart team. And even though they're going to be at home for this game, Baltimore's going to be hungry. You know, Baltimore's a team, they completely blew it week 17 last year. Should have beaten the Bengals, should have gotten in the playoffs. They would have actually been the five seed if they got in. I have not going 9-7 and seven again. I have them making the playoffs this time as a six seed. So I think Baltimore, they're going to be hungry. Baltimore's going to have one of the de best defenses in football this year. Opportunistic football team, good-looking secondary, a whole bunch of sacks. They're going to get after it. And I just look at it, and I think, you know what? Defense, more often than not, wins championships in the playoffs. That's not always the case. But I think Baltimore, even on the road, playing a Tennessee team that, again, just for whatever reason, still feels like a little bit of an upstart. I feel good about Baltimore. Now, again, I know a lot of people aren't crazy about Joe Flacco, and I've never been a big Flacco guy either. But Flacco's kind of in a position because of his defense, kind of like past Baltimore teams with their defense, where the quarterback, whether it's Flacco or somebody else, doesn't have to look amazing week in and week out. You just have to go out there and, and play well enough to win, kind of like Blake Bortles in Jacksonville last year. And that's kind of what Joe Flacco's first five years in the NFL were. The only time he really lit it up, of course, was that 2012 postseason when they won the Super Bowl. So he picked a great time to, to look amazing. But more often than not, in the regular season, as well as previous postseason appearances, Flacco really didn't do a whole hell of a lot, but he just had a, a tremendous defense, and that was enough. So I feel like in the matchup of a Tennessee offense, it looks like it could be one of the best and most potent in football this year against one of the very best defenses in Baltimore. Remember, special teams-wise, of course, they have Justin Tucker, best kicker in football. I feel like Baltimore's going to go on the road, and they're going to find a way to get this thing done. I think Joe Flacco is going to play well enough. Remember, their running game became a top 10 to 12 unit last year. I think they're going to continue to get better. They're going to, they have a pretty decent offensive line, and they add some pretty good receivers. Of course, they have Michael Crabtree, who's, who... Didn't have a great year last year, but I think he could bounce back a little bit this year. So I think Baltimore is going to go in there, and I think they're going to get the job done. Now, the other game with Houston beating the Chargers 31-24, my big thing with San with, with, sorry, my big thing with Los, the Los Angeles Chargers, not San Diego, Los Angeles Chargers, is A, they play in that football stadium that holds 25,000. It's pathetic. And it's basically a road game every single week. So you know there's going to be a million Texans fans at that game if this game hypothetically happens. But secondly, you know, Phillip Rivers, he's a heck of a quarterback. He's probably, he's, if he doesn't go in first ballot Hall of Fame, he'll definitely be a Hall of Famer at some point. I don't think he's ever going to win a Super Bowl. I don't even think he's going to ever get to a Super Bowl. But the thing with Rivers, for all the great things he can do, he's also a guy that doesn't really win a whole lot of meaningful games. Yeah, I've heard Matt, Matthew Stafford kind of get criticized for the same thing. Matthew Stafford has a lot of fourth quarter comebacks, game winning drives, but he doesn't beat a whole lot of good teams, doesn't have a lot of meaningful wins, hasn't been, been able to win the playoffs yet. 
Philip Rivers is kind of like the AFC version of that. Like he just he just doesn't win a whole lot of meaningful games. And there's a lot of times that late in games, even in even kind of in the third quarter for that matter, he'll he'll have that one costly interception. He'll make that one costly play. There's been a lot of times where he's had opportunities late in games to to rally the Chargers back either to win the game or force overtime, and he threw a costly interception, couldn't get the job done. He's not a particularly particularly clutch quarterback. Never really has been. So. I look at the the Chargers, and I say, you know what, if it comes down to a late-game situation like that, I don't know if I feel great about Rivers. And presumably the Texans will be a lot better defensively this year. They were wor- the worst in football last year, but remember that's because they were out without J.J. Watt, who was the best defensive player in football when healthy, and then, of course, Whitney Merciless, and they had some other guys banged up as well. So I think if Watt can somehow stay healthy this year and can somehow be available for the playoffs, Whitney Merciless and all these other guys – Hold up! Remember they've got Tyran Matthew now too, too back there at the safety. That's going to be a really, really improved Texans defense, and they'll get their sack total up, and they'll really get after it against the Chargers. And then the other thing too is, look, the Texans don't have a very good offensive line. They have a lot of issues there. They're trying to figure some things out. And Deshaun Watson's probably going to be running for his life a lot this year, like he was last year. But at the same time, he's going to have all season long to get used to running for his life if he isn't already used to it already after seven NFL games, really six and a half NFL games. So I feel like he'll find a way to overcome that Chargers pass rush, which obviously is very, very fierce when you think about Joey Bosa, think about Melvin Ingram, very, very tough to overcome. But also the Chargers, even more so than the Texans, have just been so cursed and for many, many years now as far as injuries they've had they've been decimated so much due to injuries and so and Jason Verrett you know their corner he already went down beating a training camp so who knows how healthy the Chargers are going to be they might have a whole bunch of injuries on both sides of the football they might miss the playoffs remember their team that gets off to a slow start every year we'll see but nonetheless I I just feel like Deshaun Watson is going to play really really well in this game because again I'm not sure how healthy the Chargers will be defensively and so that'll help out Watson DeAndre Hopkins will make some plays as he usually does, and, and Watson might make a couple plays with his feet. So I like the Texans to hold on 31-24, make a stop at the end against Rivers and company. Now going over to the NFC wildcard side, I have the world defending world champion Philadelphia Eagles actually as a three seed. I, I actually have them narrowly missing out on getting the two seed. I, I actually have the Rams as the two seed, and I'll get to that more in a little bit. But I haven't beating the Carolina Panthers as a six seed. I have the Falcons and the Panthers and the Saints, all three of those NFC South teams, back in the playoffs once again this year. Actually, one thing I want to point out real quick, on average, of the 12 NFL teams that make the playoffs, every year there's, on average, five new playoff teams that weren't in the postseason the year before. So that's about half the field. And just kind of to give you a heads up, I actually have zero new playoff teams in the NFC this year. I have three in the AFC. Actually, I just mentioned what Baltimore, the Chargers, and the Texans. So I actually just gave you the three already. But I, I think, you know what, there's a few, I mean, the Packers, we'll see. They have a very, very good chance of getting this field, and they could make a Super Bowl run. But again, they're decimated by injuries. Uh, obviously, the Cowboys, but I have them going 9-7. and seven. So we'll see. There's a few teams that are, are going to have a chance to get in and be teams that didn't make the playoffs last year. But, for, but my predictions, I have zero new playoff teams from the NFC this year. But anyways... I have the Eagles narrowly missing out on getting a first-round bye again. I have them as a three-seed, and I have the Panthers as a six-seed. I have the Eagles beating the Panthers 23-14. My other wild card, NFC wildcard game, I have the Falcons as a five-seed, and they're going to beat, beat the, their division rival, their AFC South rival, who will win the AFC South once again this year, the New Orleans Saints. I have them going on the road in New Orleans, Superdome, beating them 24-17. So let's go over those. So Carolina... Already a really, really rough offseason. They've had a whole lot of training camp injuries. Offensive line's kind of looking like a mess, and, and we know Cam's never been an elite quarterback, so that could really hurt him. Trying to break in a new coordinator in North Turner, who's legendary offensive coordinator. Cam's going to have to adjust that and try to become a more accurate quarterback. Defensively, you know, Thomas Davis, he's suspended for the four, first four games. Luke Keekley had a great bounce back year last year, but he had some health issues in the past and concussions. We'll see what happens there. The secondary, they're making improvements, but they're still not there yet. They still have a ways to go. So overall, there's a lot of concern there with Carolina, and it will be tough because of what's happened in training camp for them to get off to a good start. 
and make the playoffs. But I'll be honest with you, I didn't think they were going to make the playoffs last year. They got off to a fantastic start, almost won the division, finished 11-5. So I have them as a sixth seed. I have them sneaking in. I think Atlanta wedged them out for second place in the NFC South this time around. But at any rate, I have the Eagles winning 23-14 in that game, which of course will be in Philly. I, I just... You know, I look at, I mean, obviously the weather part of it, we don't know if these cold weather teams, what the weather conditions will be like in January, but you expect it to not be great. But I just kind of feel like the, the Eagles are the defending world champions. I don't think they're going to let the first playoff game the very next year as they're defending their crown. I don't think they're going to let it slip through their hands. I, I, I just feel like they're going to win at least one playoff game, and I'll get to how they do the rest of the postseason in, in, a, few, in a little bit, but... I just don't think they're going to lose that first playoff game. And I definitely don't think it's going to be against the Panthers. I think Carolina, again, some issues with the offensive line. Philadelphia has a great pass rush. They have all that depth with their defensive line. So they're going to give Cam Newton some trouble all night long. I think the only thing that keeps Carolina in the game is I think the defense does some things against Philadelphia, Philadelphia's offense. And I think what happens is Philly, like last year's, uh, divisional playoff, or well, actually a divisional playoff, this is a wild card, but last year's divisional playoff game, when they played the Falcons, they had five field goals. They won that game 15-10, and of course they made a stop there in the red zone at the end to hang on and win the game. But I just feel like this is going to be another situation, another first playoff game for Philly this year where they're going to settle for some field goals. They're not going to be able to convert in the red zone consistently. And so because of that, that's going to keep Carolina hanging around enough but Philly will still find a way to win that game 23-14. The other game I have the Falcons beating the Saints was a 24-17. It's going to be hard to go into New Orleans in Mercedes-Benz Superdome and win that football game if you're the Falcons. But remember, again, division rivals, they're going to play each other twice a year. The Falcons will have already played in Superdome once already last year. My concern with the Saints, and I mentioned this when I did my Saints preview a couple weeks back, is – where are the Saints going to be mentally? We know they have a ton of talent. They've got a terrific football team. But where are they going to be mentally? Are, are they going to, in the back of their minds, are they going to be thinking about last year leading up to the game? And, and, of course, what I'm talking about is the Minneapolis Miracle when they lost the very last play of the game against the Vikings. We all know what happened there. Is that going to be in their heads, not just throughout the season, but especially when playoff time comes and they have a tight game? Is that going to be in their heads before the game and maybe even during the game? And that could be something that kind of messes with them mentally a little bit. But I think also Atlanta, you know, you've got Julio Jones. You've got Devontae Freeman. Tevin Coleman is in a contract year. He's going to want to have a really good year, and he'll, he'll be a nice compliment once again to Freeman. I just don't think the Falcons' offense is going to be as bad again as they were last year. I think they're going to make a, take a big, big step this year, and I think they're going to get back closer to where they were Probably won't be the number one offense in football like they were two years ago under Kyle Shanahan in 2016, but they definitely should be a top 5-10 to 10 unit again. So that's going to help them a lot. But I also think another thing, too, is defensively, they brought in Marquand Manuel, brand-new defense coordinator last year, did a tremendous job. They were a top-10 defense. And they're going to continue to get better and better defensively. They aren't a real playmaking team in the secondary, and that is a little bit concerning, especially when you go against Drew Brees. But they have a big-time playmaking linebacker in Deion Jones, tremendous linebacker. He's basically like a hybrid linebacker, safety, corner, kind of all rolled into one. Really, really amazing player. And I feel like Deion Jones is going to just do something late in that game to preserve the victory for the Falcons. I think he could pick off Drew Brees, make that big play. So it's going to be a great matchup, going to be a great game. Of course, New Orleans is a much more defensive-minded team now than they were in the past. Last year began that, of course. Atlanta, a lot of defense. So, you know, some people will look at that and say, well, you know, that could be like a 38-31 type of game. But, again, they're going to play each other two times in the regular season, obviously, being division rivals. So they're going to kind of know what each team likes, what, you, what each other likes to do. They're not going to be intimidated by one another. And so it's going to be much more of a defensive struggle in the playoffs. And that happens a lot in the playoffs. So ultimately, at the end of the day, I have the Falcons advancing and upsetting the Saints. And that was a tough pick for me because I, I was really tempted to put the Saints all the way in the NFC Championship game, possibly even get to the Super Bowl. I know some people are picking the Saints to win the Super Bowl, but nonetheless, that's the way I'm looking at it. So now you go the next week and you've got the divisional playoffs. AFC divisional playoffs. Let's see what I got here. I actually have the Steelers edging out the Patriots as the one seed in the AFC. 
And I have them taking on the arch rival Ravens, who won the previous week. The Ravens, again, the sixth seed. I have Pittsburgh beating the Ravens in an epic game. Of course, they're the best rivalry in the NFL, one of the best rivalries in sports. I have the Steelers beating the Ravens 27-24 in overtime, and I'll get to that in a moment. And then the other game, Patriots, like I said, they'll be the two. They'll play the five, number five Texans. I have the Patriots winning that game 35-21. So looking at the Steelers-Ravens game, Pittsburgh has Baltimore's number. Pittsburgh just finds a way to, to beat Baltimore just about every time, it seems like, including the playoffs especially. And I don't think it's going to change this time around. I just think the Pittsburgh offense, as good as the Baltimore defense is, even last year when the Baltimore defense was on a roll late in the season, Pittsburgh put 39 on them late in the regular season. That was in Pittsburgh. This game, of course, too, would be in Pittsburgh. So I think the Steelers are going to find a way to get it done. But this is one thing I'm going to uh, point out. It's going to be a little bit interesting. I think the Steelers could have a double-digit lead going in the fourth quarter, maybe like a 24-10 to 10 type lead. And I actually think the Ravens are going to rally back, and they're going to force overtime. But then what's going to happen is Pittsburgh's going to get the ball first. Chris ball, Boswell is going to make a field goal to put him ahead 27-24. Baltimore gets the ball back. Justin Tucker, again, best kicker in football, but as much range as he has, Baltimore's probably not going to get within his range. They'll, they might not even get to midfield, maybe get to midfield at best. So they'll have to go for it fourth down, and they won't get it. They'll turn it over on downs. So I have Pittsburgh winning the game. I just think, you know what, Baltimore can be a dangerous team, but there's always that one team that's kind of your Achilles heel. And for Baltimore, it's Pittsburgh. They just struggle to consistently beat Pittsburgh, especially again in the playoffs. I don't think it's really going to change this year, even though I really, really like Baltimore's defense a lot. I wouldn't be surprised if Baltimore ends up with the best defense in football. I know you've got Jacksonville and you've got Philly and you've got Minnesota, but I wouldn't be shocked if Baltimore ends up having the best defense. Nonetheless, I actually just think that they'll rally in the fourth quarter, get the job done, do what they need to do, but in overtime, it won't be enough and still will find a way to win. Patriots, obviously, that won't be as close of a game there. Foxborough, 35-21 over the Texans. Remember two years ago, and, and of course, back then, Texans didn't have Deshaun Watson. He was still in college at Clemson. But two years ago, they went into Foxborough, and they played the Patriots tough for an entire half, and then they completely fell apart in the second half. Last year, we saw one of their South rivals, of course, the Tennessee Titans, go into Foxborough for the divisional playoffs. They played them tough for not quite a half. It was the entire first quarter, and really even probably half of the second quarter. And then they completely fell apart, and they got their butts kicked. And, and basically... Brady and company, they turned it up in the second half. Gronk did his thing. All these guys started to turn it up offensively. The defense tightened up. So one thing I will say is if the Patriots play like they did against the Texans in the first half two years ago in 2016, if they play like that again in this game against the Texans, wouldn't be surprised if the Texans find a way to upset them. But I just don't see the Patriots losing in the divisional playoff. Houston's an upstart team. Deshaun Watson, you know, tremendous young player, hard to, bet, hard to bet against him. But again, this might be Brady's last season, might be Belichick's last season. They're not going to go down in, the first, in their first playoff game, in divisional playoffs. So that's why I got the Patriots winning that game 35-21. Second half, they'll turn it up again, Brady, Gronk. They'll start to do their thing. And then, of course, a concern, too, with the Texans is how healthy are they going to be, especially on the defense side of the football. And that's something that could really plague them just getting into the playoffs Something that could plague them, of course, just winning their wild card playoff game, which, of course, I have them beating the Chargers. So, nonetheless, I think the Patriots will start running away in the second half after a close first half, and that's how it's going to go. As far as the NFC divisional playoff, I have the Vikings as the number one seed. I have them beating the Falcons 28 27, and then I have the Rams. Like I said, they're going to edge out the Eagles as a two seed. And they're going to also edge them out head to head in the divisional playoff. I have them at home in LA beating the Eagles 26 19. So, first of all, looking at the first game with the Vikings, Kirk Cousins, he, he has a track record. He has a history of being accused of not being particularly clutch, not really getting it done in late game situations. I do feel like with a better all-around football team now, especially that defense, I think he's going to start proving people wrong a little bit more. I think he's going to be a little bit more clutch than he's been in the past. I think he's going to start getting it done in late game situations more. And this is going to be a golden opportunity for him. There's going to be a lot of pressure on him this year, of course. Going to be at home, so obviously weather won't be a factor. And he actually wouldn't even be a factor if it was in Atlanta, because obviously that too is indoors. But nonetheless, I look at it, and I think last 
two minute drill. That's what it's all about in the NFL. I think the Vikings are going to find a way down 27, 21, drive down the field last two minutes, score a touchdown, get the extra point. It, it won't be as dramatic as the Mir- Minneapolis miracle was last year against the saints. But I do think there will be a little bit of that special feeling like, Oh, you know, this is the Minneapolis miracle part two, blah, blah, blah. But I just kind of look at the Falcons Matt Ryan's and another quarterback that's never really been particularly clutch. At, you know, he has his name, Matty Ice, that he's had forever, but historically really hasn't been overly clutch. He hasn't always won the, the big, meaningful games. He hasn't always got done, especially in the playoffs. He's had a lot of ups and downs, and he's, he's fallen apart. We saw what happened to the Super Bowl. He's having a great Super Bowl, and then he, you know, struggled towards the end there. The Patriots came back and won a couple years ago. So I, I think Kirk Cousins and company, I think Adam Thielen, I think Stefan Diggs, they'll make some key catches down the stretch, and I think they'll find a way to win this ball game. So that's what's going to happen there. The other game, you know, when you look at the Eagles and you look at the Rams, don't really care where it's played, but my thing is I think the Eagles, in my predictions, are going to struggle for a second straight week as far as putting the ball in the end zone. I think they'll get a lot of yards. They'll move the ball pretty well. But in the red zone, you got to score touchdowns. You can't settle for field goals. But I think both teams, because they have some pretty strong defenses, I think they'll tighten up the red zone, and we're going to see a whole hell of a lot of field goals. So the, this 26-19 score, it's going to be due to field goals. It's not going to be due to missed extra points or whatever. So 26 for the Rams, that would be, what, four field goals. And then the Eagles, 19 points, that would be, that would be yeah, that would be four field goals as well. So, yeah, Bozeman will have four field goals with the Rams will have one more touchdown. So obviously, that's going to be the difference. So, yeah, I look at it, and, and I think that, the Rams, with all the money that they've invested this offseason, I, I kind of feel like their window of opportunity might be a lot shorter than it really should be because they're going to probably start having some real cap issues in a couple of years, all the money that they've been giving, all these contracts they've been handing out. And I just think with the Eagles, again, and I've, I've mentioned this before, some of the things I've written and everything else, these quarterbacks coming off these torn ACLs that, that first year back, they're not always completely themselves, even at the season's end. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens with Deshaun Watson, interesting to see what happens with Ryan Tannehill in Miami, interesting to see what happens with Wentz in Philly. And who, who's to say Wentz, you know, he got banged up, and I believe he missed something like two, ga- two or three games his rookie year back in 2016. Remember, he missed a good chunk of preseason. And then last year he goes down with, what, three or four games left in regular season, misses that and the playoffs. So unfortunately, who's to say he won't be hurt again, and it might be Foles who's forced to play, and he might not be able to replicate last year's magic. But I think the Eagles are going to struggle to convert in the red zone. They're going to sell for field goals, and the Rams, Goff, Gurley, and company, they'll do just enough, and they'll get that extra score, and they'll be able to find a way to win the football game, advance to the NFC Championship, which, of course, will be played in Minnesota. So I've got the Steelers, Patriots, Vikings, Rams, all one versus two seed matchups. We don't always see that happen all the time. We always see lower seed and some wild cards uh, find a way to get in there. But I think this will be a year where the one versus two will be the conference championship. Not not super exciting, I know, but those will be the conference championship games. AFC title game, I have the Steelers over the Patriots 38-34, which is ironically the same score that the Colts beat the Patriots in the 2006 AFC title game. And then I have the Vikings beating the Rams – 28-14, that game won't be as dramatic. So let me kind of skip ahead to the Vikings game first, kind of get that out of the way. 28-14, yeah, it doesn't sound like that great, that close of a game. I think the Vikings will be in control throughout the afternoon. I just think, you know, the Vikings, they have a a fierce defense. We know the Rams have a lot of balance, but a big part of what they do is Todd Gurley. I mean, I think he had 37% of their touches or yards or something like that last year, and that's going to be the case again this year, especially after paying him $15 million a year. But I, I just think it's going to be really tough trying to run the football against the Minnesota Vikings and, and their defensive front. So if they can't run the ball well, that puts it in Goff's hands. And I think he'll do okay, but I think he's going to be pressured. I think he'll be on his back a lot. And so points are going to be hard to come by for the Rams. And I think for the Vikings, Kirk Cousins will once again have another really stellar afternoon. He'll play well. I think the running game will get going. The receivers will look good. 
yeah, they have Marcus Peters, amazing corner, but remember, they also have Aqib Tlaib, and Aqib Tlaib is something like, I think, 33-ish now, 33, 34. So he's getting up there in age, and he's still a really good player, but you wonder if maybe the age will start to catch up to him at certain points this season, and perhaps Kirk Cousins and company will exploit him, really kind of pick on him in this football game, and that could be enough, and that could be the difference to win at 28-24, or 28-14, I should say, my apologies. Uh, and then as far as the other game with the Steelers winning the AFC title game at home over the Patriots, obviously last year when they played late in the regular season, they got railroaded on that call, the Jesse James play at the end, so they should have won. I, I'm kind of worried about making this pick because I just mentioned Baltimore, their Achilles heel, heel is Pittsburgh. Well, Pittsburgh's Achilles heel is the Patriots. So, you know, don't I don't feel great about making the pick, but I also feel like there's just something off about the Patriots this year. They've had a lot of in-house distractions, a lot of in-house issues, and it just feels like there's a little bit of a divide. The defense is, looks like it's going to probably be even worse than it was last year. Last year didn't give up a whole lot of points, but they were a major bend, don't break type of defense. Of course, they broke in the Super Bowl. Malcolm Butler is no longer there, so they're not going to be as strong defensively, not that they were to begin with. Remember, Matt Patricia is now in Detroit, and they're going to use basically n- no defensive coordinator. They're going to have... One of, the, one of their linebackers coach and basically him and Belichick will be kind of like co-coordinators. So that's going to be probably kind of an awkward thing there. And, and Belichick likes to kind of run everything anyways. But I look at it, and, and I don't know if Gronks will be, be available for this game. Of course, he was great in the second half against the Steelers last year, and he's a big reason why the Patriots won that regular season game last year. And But you know what? The Steelers, Mike Tomlin, a lot of people say he's a cheerleader guy, doesn't get it done in the big games and big moments. Going to have a new coordinator this year. Todd Haley, Todd Haley's no longer there. I, I just feel like for the Steelers, it's now or never. This could be Ben Roethlisberger's last season. You know, you never know with Ben, but it could be his last season. Going to be Le'Veon Bell's last season in Pittsburgh. So I look at it and I just think it's now or never for the Steelers to beat the Patriots. And I think the Patriots are going to be a little bit weaker, a little bit more vulnerable this year. And a big thing too is the Steelers, even though they don't have really one dominant pass rusher for now, although TJ Watt, young guy on the rise, really nice rookie year, they did lead the league in sacks last year with 56. And I think they will be one of the league leaders again with probably 50 plus. Patriots offense line looks terrible. I mean, they were fine in the preseason, but generally speaking, as far as what they have, they're going to have a lot of issues, particularly at tackle, and I think the Steelers will exploit that, get after Brady, and I think that'll be enough to find a way to win this football game. I still think by the score, of course, 38-34, it's going to be a shootout, but I think what's going to happen is I think each quarterback, Roethlisberger and Brady, will kind of match each other wit for wit, but I think ultimately at the end of the day, Ben will put them ahead kind of mid to late fourth quarter. Patriots will get the ball last like they typically do quite a bit, but I think what's going to happen is the Steelers will find a way to make that one last stop against Brady and company. Again, I just feel like something's off there with the Patriots. They've had a lot of kind of in-house issues there going on, kind of dating back to last year. So it, it just doesn't – it's not a good feeling in New England that this is a Super Bowl-type team. And especially another thing you have to consider is – in the past, the Patriots, every time they've lost the Super Bowl, they've never gotten back to the Super Bowl the very next year. They haven't gone back they haven't gotten the back to back to back Super Bowls after losing the previous year. You know, two thousand and seven, of course they lose to the Giants, didn't get back in until twenty eleven. They lose to the Giants again, didn't get back until twenty fourteen. Brady, even though he looked great preseason, he's forty one now. Him and Belichick, their relationship's not as great. Belichick's relationship with a lot of his defensive guys isn't as great. There's just something missing in New England this year, and I think Pittsburgh, Mike Tomlin desperately needs to take advantage of that. The Steelers desperately need to take advantage of that. So in my article earlier today, or I guess it would be yesterday now by the time I publish this, but I mentioned how uh, I lost my th- well, I lost my train of thought, so I guess I'll, I'll forget that. But anyways, it's now or never for the Steelers is basically the point. So I just feel like they got to get it done. You know, Tomlin, he doesn't want to get criticized anymore. Well, you got to beat the Patriots, so we'll see. But I feel like this is their best opportunity to do it, to do it so we'll see. Finally, Super Bowl 53, February 3rd, Atlanta, new Mercedes-Benz Stadium, whatever the hell they call it. They've got Chick-fil-A, but, of course, it'll be Sunday, so they won't serve it. Really blows. 
Not that I'm going to be at the game or anything, but whatever. Um, I've got the Steelers beating the Vikings 30-21. to 21. Now, Super Bowls every single year are close. It, it, you just rarely ever see blowouts in Super Bowls anymore. You used to see a number of blowouts here and there in the Super Bowl in the past, but it's just something that you really don't see anymore. The games are so close. Maybe they're fixed a little bit because of the betting lines. I don't know. Who knows? But at any rate, however it, it goes, it's not going to be a blowout. But I don't really feel like the Vikings are ever going to really be in control of this. Oh, okay. I know, I know what I was going to say, by the way, about on my, in my article that I wrote uh, pertaining to this. What I mentioned is the NFC is going to be the superior conference once again. It's going to be much better than the AFC for yet another year. However, with that being said, this is where I'm going to kind of sound, uh, I don't know, but I actually think that the AFC Championship game, if it is the Patriots versus the Steelers, if that's the matchup, I actually think that'll be the de facto Super Bowl. So that's a big reason why I have the Steelers winning the Super Bowl. If the Steelers can get past the Patriots, I have no doubt in my mind that they'll beat whoever they face in Super Bowl 53, even if it's the Eagles, it's the Rams, Vikings, who I have them beating, whoever it is, they're going to find a way to win. So even though... It sounds weird that I said the NFC is a way better conference, but yet the AFC title games would be the fact of Super Bowl. That's just the way I feel about it. So I have the Steelers not only getting past the Patriots, once they get the Super Bowl, there's no way they're going to lose it. I've been winning 30-21. to 21. Vikings will hang around. They'll do some things in that game, and their defense, I think, will tighten up a lot in the second half. I think they'll struggle in the first half against the Steelers, but I think they'll tighten up in the second half. Still some issues as far as giving up big plays, and that's going to be an issue when you go against Antonio Brown. Of course, you got Juju Smith-Schuster. He's going to make some big plays. But they're going to hang around. But I just think that, you know what, the Steelers will do enough against Kirk Cousins, kind of keep them out of rhythm, kind of keep that offense out of rhythm. And they're going to score a number of points. And there might be a couple times where they leave points on the board, but they're going to move the ball really well against the Vikings defense. So I think the Steelers are going to find a way to win this ball game no matter what, and I've got them winning that game. 30 to 21. So there you have it. That's my 2018 playoff predictions and my Super Bowl 53 prediction. And that game's going to be on CBS, by the way. It'll be Tony Romo and Jim Nance. So that's, that's all I got for you. So that's going to be my prediction. We'll see as season's end how close I was or how ridiculously off I was. I could be very much off, but I'm going to go with the Steelers. I'm going to say that they break through, they beat the Patriots, and then again in the Super Bowl, no way they lose. Ben's going to look great. Brown's going to look great. I would say, just kind of for the hell of it, to throw it out there, as far as Super Bowl MVP, kind of an interesting question. I'm going to go Juju Smith-Schuster because the Vikings are probably a game plan around Antonio Brown. I don't think Le'Veon Bell is going to have an amazing game by any means. I think it will be a pass-heavy game. Ben should have a really good game, but I think Juju's going to be Super Bowl MVP, so that's how I'll go. But anyways, go to SugarHuddle.com. Make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel, as always. NFL season's coming up here in a few days. I'm going to make some predictions as far as betting lines. I'm going to pick who's going to cover, who won't cover, and I'll have that video out within the next day or two, so please look for that. And again, go to sugarhuddle.com, check it all out. Thank you.